guys. It's such a pleasure. I mean, you, you know, when, when we were working on this idea of having this sort of three-way, it's a new thing for us, so I don't know how this is going to go. Sorry, badly, but uh, you know, it's uh, you know, there's such a such an emotional connection with uh, with you too, because you've been my first two interviews in the podcast. So you know, everything started with you guys. This thing's blown out of proportion, uh, you know, and you know, the moment is much bigger than I thought it would ever get. Uh, uh, but you know, uh, so it's it's kind of going going back in time and looking at at, at you again, and I, you know, I, I can say again what I said because I I think it's yeah. You guys are getting older, particularly Steve. You know, there's a little gray there. <laughs> yeah, you, know, you don't get the, the gray is, is is a distinguishing characteristic. Uh, you know, I walk around on the campus now, and the students call me. You know, they never called me like uh, Dr. Townsend or anything like that. It was like either Steve or Dr. T, depending on comfort. Now they call me OG, oh, right? Wow. Original gangster. Uh, it, you know, I love that. Sorry? Yeah, I, I'll take that. But the balding thing, man, it hurts. You know, Frank's not dealing with that, but. This stuff just like it's eradicated up top. It's gone. I've got I've got these real this real good Italian man here, you know. So, uh, I'm, and I'm I'm gonna keep it grown out as long as I can. It's actually very short now, just just to enjoy it while I can, because you know these things don't last forever. I'm the only proper Italian here. There's not much hair left, so I I, I don't know about that, Frank. Uh, but yeah, yeah, you probably represent the ethnicity better than I do. Despite my passport. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, my, my answers are from Palermo, so, you know, down south. Uh, yeah, yeah, no, I'm, I'm a northerner, so, yeah, I don't even care. I know you're a proper Italian, so. Um, with dual passports, it's, I don't, yeah, I don't count. Anyway, the, the, the idea for us today was really uh, trying to show people that, well, everybody knows that you're a great scientist. There's, there's, there's a lot of cool things you're still doing. I've, 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 I've checked on you, you know, since, since we, we, we spoke the first time more than a year ago. And, and obviously you guys are, are, are keeping up with your great work and, and it's great to see. Uh, but that's, that's not the point today. We want to demonstrate that chemists can be fun people, right? Uh, you know, who, who better than the two of you, who, by the way, were our first two guests. Uh, and by the way, to two of the most popular episodes uh, we have, you know, if you look at you know, the statistics, well, by the way, Frank, how do you feel about Steve being ahead of you by at <laughs> least a couple of hundred downloads? That uh, completely expected. I mean, one of the reasons <laughs> I want to talk to Steve is I think he may be one of the most interesting men in the world, science or not. Uh, and I want to I want to dig into that and get to know him a little better. So, yeah, I think after this episode, I'm, I just want to piggyback off Steve's popularity is pretty much why I am here. Oh, that's the strategy. Well, that's, that's so smart, and we'll see how Steve will respond to that. Anyway, that's beautiful, Frank. So my my plan for today is taking the back seat and let let you guys running a little bit. That's make me make me feel a bit uncomfortable, quite a lot uncomfortable, <laughs> if I'm honest. But let's see how this goes. You know, I, I can still jump in and you know put you back with back back on track. So Frank, why don't you get started, man? Let's let's start and digging into Steve's personal little dirty dirty secrets. <laughs> there you go. Uh, well, how's it going, Steve? You know, not too bad. And, uh, you know, I'll go ahead and jump in and, and comment on what you said before about like the, the, the head on downloads and, and that stuff. You know, we were talking about chemistry in the southeastern United States at the group a couple of weeks ago. I, you know, I told the students, you know, I think Frank is probably the strongest chemist in this area of the country. Right. So that, that I'm ahead in, in these downloads to me defies logic because, you know, Frank is the man. Right. Uh, you know, and I explained to my group why I think that. And then we went through and sort of did a review on your portfolio and what's been going on in the lab. So, you know, after this thing, right, your numbers, sh- sh- mine, down that thing. <laughs> we'll, uh, we'll see. I'll, I'll let you guys know. We'll keep track of the stats. But, you know, for now, you're ahead, Steve. So, you know, just own it. Yeah, I'm a, I'm generally bad at taking compliments. So uh, thank you very much. Um, you know, it's good. I think, you know, typically... You know, maybe we'll get into this later, but I'm I'm generally driven by you know uh, just kind of a general impending doom of insecurity. Uh, so it's you know it, it's it's very nice to hear that, but uh, you know I, I also don't want to lose my edge, so I have to keep being driven, right? So I'll, it I, I may let it go in one ear and out the other. Well, you know, we're both former you know uh, footballers, right? And that was Jerry Rice's perspective, right? After winning a Super Bowl, Steve Young is like Jerry Rice isn't celebrating. He's in the stadium running laps right through the stands, right? Catching balls from the cleaning crew. 
Uh, so I think, you know, you always got to keep an edge. And, uh, you know, to me, you know, I want the students to always think when they achieve something that is great and they should celebrate it. Uh, personally, I never let that linger too long. It's like, yes, this paper's in, what do I need to write next? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, no, it is super important to celebrate successes. And actually, that's one thing I feel like I got from football, right? Like, on to the next play, you know, kind of always looking forward, always, always uh, pushing towards the next thing. And I actually realized as a mentor at some point, I was not, I was not actively celebrating everybody's successes as much as I should have, because it's kind of not right. It wasn't my MO. It's not kind of how I'm wired. Uh, and that's actually something I had to change after, after interacting with lots of students and realizing, right? Like their time in graduate school is really short. And as you know, si science is a long, painful slog most of the time, right? So those high points, especially for students who are kind of really in it every day and, and kind of, you know, not only dealing with challenges with science, but also like right there, 22 to 26, most of them, they're kind of figuring out who they are, their place in the world, right? So these celebrating these things is is really important and, and uh, right, gives them wins along the way in, in a challenging time, both personally and professionally for them. You know, I had a former trainee, Skylar Chambers. She's going to be on the academic market soon. Just brilliant woman who I think is going to take my job. Uh, but one day she came in my office and was like, dude, you, you know, the, the lab has been honored with a bunch of awards. Where's the evidence of it? You don't, you know, we work really hard for this stuff and you, you don't have any of these plaques up, none of these, right? So I had to change my perspective because I'm the type of guy to get, you know, if something happens, it's like, cool, this is positive, but let's like never talk about it again. But that's, that's offensive to them because they work so hard, man, uh, that you got to celebrate all of their wins because it's all of our wins. And that was something I had to change too. Do, do, do you think, do you think you don't do it because you're kind of humble and it's like, you don't want to take it all for, for yourself or is it, you know, did, did you miss the fact that actually it's your work as much as theirs? Yeah. You know, I just prefer to lay in the background, I guess. Yeah. And I, I love to like go out and give seminars and sort of promote them and their work. Uh, and any contribution that I have to their success. But, you know, I just don't want the spotlight <laughs> personally on me. I could do without, you know, I got to drive kids around to yoga and like make hot dogs and chicken nuggets and crap, man. Uh, so, yeah. I... There's there's nothing that will humble you like having young children. Uh, <laughs> right? <laughs> no, I think, you know, for me, it's more like the joy of this job is in the process. Right. Like every every Thursday morning, I spend three hours straight in subgroup and like that's the joy. Right. Like really digging into problems with my students like they teach me so much. I'm just like astounded all the time. And like that's where I get my satisfaction and my fulfillment. And again, the awards are great and it's important for the lab. Right. And it's important. You know, it it provides right the students you know, coming from a lab, right, let, let's say that's one of a lot of awards that helps their career, right? So as, as much as, you know, I think our, our job is kind of, I feel like I have two roles in my job. One is to do cutting edge research, obviously, and hopefully at some point, you know, that could be put out right into the real world, or at least like those ideas could be taken up by others. Um, but my, you know, my other job, I feel like is to be a vessel through which really talented students can achieve their career goals and can go on to make a difference. Right. And I, I feel like as I, I guess we're, we're still young in the academic, I think you could be a young academic <laughs> until you're like six well, years or something. Right? Steve, Steve uh, look uh, like an academic, not a young one anymore, but it, it's, it's good. <laughs> um, but I think as you like, as I kind of get more established and I guess a little more comfortable in the job, right. Um, I feel like that's more and more of my job is to be that vessel through which I can educate students and allow them to achieve what they want to do. But there's a, there's a third aspect, Frank, right? I, th I think we need to be honest. It's, you also want to do good for yourself. I mean, there's nothing bad about that, isn't it? You know, I'm, I'm sure you guys, for how much humble you are, you know, you're still very ambitious people. So that, uh, yeah, so this actually transitions. I'm super competitive. I like, in a scientific arena, I try not to talk about it uh you play football uh, so. <laughs> yeah, steve and i both played college athletics right which takes a certain mindset uh and one thing i want to ask steve so steve played for nick saban who is by far the most famous american college football coach yeah i think it may be bill Jel belichick's like a more famous football coach period but probably nick saban's over too so like steve t like take us through that how how was that experience how did you get recruited like what was that like 
Yeah, well, you, you know, my year was actually so the, the the overlap was tiny because Nick Saban moved on to LSU. Oh, okay. And you were at Michigan State. Yeah, so that was like that that right at that that window. Uh, and you know, it becomes so today's like NCAA college world is pretty controversial because you know there's like uh, player compensation. Some people believe in it. I believe in it. Uh, some people mm -hmm. do not. Uh, there there's people being able to have a little bit more freedom to move around. Uh, so, so, you know, that wasn't the case back in the early 2000s, right? Uh, I think the freedom and the ability to move and do what you want w w was not there. So I, I bring that into the discussion because, you know, when I was looking at programs and going through like recruiting process, you know, my mom was adamant that people not lie to her. And it's oh, tough yeah. because, right, coaches, they're going to say some things, you know, I I'll be here forever. I'm never leaving. Uh, and, and so I think, you know, whenever I think of the process, I think of, Yes, there were things that when I look back 20 years ago, that's terrifying. But there were things that were said <laughs> that were absolutely not true. And I try to like transition that in, and tie it into chemistry because we're sort of coaches that are on the market looking for graduate students every year. And uh, one of the things whenever I'm talking to any graduate student, I try to make sure I don't say anything that's not true. Uh, you know, students will ask, are, are you ever going to move? You know, are you here forever? Right. So you got to make sure that you can give them the most honest answers possible. And to me, it stems from football because people, some people, you know, Western Michigan University is super honest, uh, you know, coaching staff. Other coaching staffs, not so much. And so when you get to a school, there were people that you expect to be there who are then gone. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, and I, I, you know, so going back to me, I would never want that to be the case for, for students here. So take, so take us through, did you, so you mentioned Western Michigan, was, did you play like, uh at a community college, junior college, and then transition? Or did you get recruited right out of high school? And then how long did you play football at Michigan State? Yeah, so, you know, all of the recruiting, uh, so, uh, right, high school player, right, normal sort of recruiting, just like everyone else, wasn't a big-time five-star athlete who's going to go on to the NFL. Uh, that that wasn't going to happen, right? Pretty good athlete. Pretty good and, athlete. And, you know, people would say academic integrity. That was a word that I heard, right? You know, Some of these guys who you recruit are people who are, good people who can play, but they're going to go destroy it in the classroom. The GPA of the team will be maintained. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They're, they're, the, the average GPA of the team is important. I was, I was, a, I was a mediocre kicker, but I definitely kept that average GPA up for, for some other really talented athletes. Didn't, didn't you hold the record of points at some point, right? So you weren't yeah, I, yeah. When I graduated, I was, uh, I had the most points scored at university of South Dakota where I was a kicker. Uh, that is, I mean, I'm very proud of that. Um, I have to say that was a lot due to my offense, right? Our running back went on to play, uh, I think another 15 years in the NFL and CFL. Our quarterback was, came in second for like the division two analogy, analogous, uh, Heisman award. So our offense was absolutely prolific. And then, you know, every so, time they, <laughs> score, I get a few points. <laughs> Lots of field goals. Your conversion was what it was, but hey, you know, if you if you kick a million, you know, some go in. Yeah, exactly. Lots of extra <laughs> points. Lots of extra points. Yeah, yeah, that's good. Steve, what role, what position were you playing at? Because Frank was a kicker, but what were you? Yeah, I, I'm an insane cornerback. Uh, oh wow! So you know that's tricky in Detroit because at least at the so you know my high school, King High School, uh, Martin Luther King High School in Detroit, the number three rated quarterback from next year is coming out of King. Uh, Sauce Gardner, who was drafted last year, number four, was the king cornerback. Uh, oh, wow. And so uh, there's a lot of people who've come out of this school. When people think Detroit, they usually think Martin Luther King or Cass Technical High School, these two rivals. Uh, so, yeah, so I was a cornerback and, uh, you know, I ended up probably, you know, saving my brain maybe. Uh, but, you know, so I tore my rotator cuff and that sort of derailed everything. Uh, mm -hmm. But, you know, I think of some of my friends who played football, many who went on to the NFL, some of them are talking, you know, 25, 35 concussions, 40 concussions. Uh, yeah. right, I've had one concussion that I know about, but, you know, it's not accounting for all the micro concussions when two bodies crash at 15 miles per hour. Uh, so, well, yeah. But well, well, you never know. The, the brain is not completely understood. Maybe that all these micro concussions made you a great scientist. I don't know. Could be. Um, <laughs> but, you know, this comes up to, so, you know, I have two daughters, uh, and, you know, Frank has a son, so you could answer the question of whether you would let your, you know, your son play football. But I think about my daughter, you know, both of them are in gymnastics. And when I watch them on these beams and, and right, these, these bars, I'm just like, man, they're going to fall and break something. 
Mm. And some of the coaches are like, yes, yeah, it's, it's almost inevitable. It's tough to watch. And I'm thinking back, you know, did, did my mom experienced this when I was like Pee Wee playing football. <laughs> you know, my poor son was just like ramming his head against someone else. Yeah, the, yeah, the question of whether I let my son play football is an, an interesting one. I mean, there's right, there's, this shouldn't be a discussion about parenting, right? But there's like this insane urge as a parent to protect your kids. But often that urge is counterproductive, right? Because like, like we all, right, gain life experience by making mistakes and falling down. And, you know, uh, so it's, I mean, that that's too much emotion gets into that to really like, you can't be scientific about your own kids, right? Like there's way too much emotion in there. It's, it's hard to be rational. Um, I, but yeah, the only thing I've decided about my, my son is like, he will not play co- tackle football until he's in high school. Like this, like elementary school, middle school tackle football. Uh, I don't think it does absolutely anything for athletic ability or or right gaining the skills you need to be a good football player. But but it, it kind of is only downsides. Right, you can play seven on seven flag football and gain you know gain all the skills and things you you would potentially need. What you need to accept as a parent is that you know they're gonna do what they want to do in life regardless, mm-hmm. right? So yeah, just accept it. It's it's a tough it's a tough job being a parent, isn't it? You know, the best thing we can do is equip them uh, with like, yeah. right, good values and all the tools they need to make positive decisions. I'm very much pro, you know, my daughter's going out and um, right, making mistakes and sort of learning and figuring out from the world. I, I do hope, though, that they can learn how to learn lessons from other people's mistakes. Uh, <laughs> you, know, so, you know, when I think of my background with my family, that was one thing that like I, I, think I became an expert at like, OK, you did that, man. And that was pretty dumb. Let me let me not do that. It's clear. Well, that, that's very smart. Not many people can do that, you know. You know, I like to think that we, we all can do that if we so choose. Fair point. Yeah. So I'm, I'll just transition the conversation here, Steve. Uh, you, I think in a, I've, I've heard you give a few different scientific lectures. And in, and in two of them, you said something really interesting that I've always wanted to dig into a little more. You said you consider yourself a humanist. Uh, and And one of the you know, attributes of that is you, you tend to read at least one book each week. Is that true? That's true. And, uh, you know, you can't see them, but my, you know, 300 pandemic books are back there in boxes. Yeah. You know, there you go. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, describe kind of, I mean, I think, you know, I, I don't know much about your life experience, but I, I, you know, from the little I've picked up, it's quite buried. Like, what brought you to that philosophy? And how do you, like, how does that kind of shape who you are, both kind of in your job and your personal life? Oh, you know, that's a deep one. So, you know, when you consider yourself a humanist, I think, you know, I like to interact daily with other human beings. I like to, to, to try to figure out what makes each individual person tick. Uh, you know, when we think about the lab, right, you know, I got, I don't know, eight or 10 people in the lab at the moment. Each of them is an individual human, which requires personalized mentorship. Uh, and so, you know, I like to really get to the bare bones of what makes us human, what makes people want to go from A to B on a day to day basis. And in the context of, of, of chemistry and then my, my life in general, I try to figure out what my place is in helping other people, right? And I think that sort of like charitable approach to life, the, 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 the desire to help people really comes from my childhood, man, where, you know, my mom was a teenage mom. Uh, you needed, she needed a significant amount of help. And so I just want to be able to pay that forward. And I feel like really just um, sort of taking a social scientist or humanities approach toward human interaction is where we can do that. I'll tell you a crazy story. So, uh, you know, there's a VA hospital here at Vanderbilt. Uh, actually, my great grandfather uh, died at that VA hospital and was treated for cancer, you know, 30 years ago. And I have pictures outside of that hospital. So I bring this place up because I was walking into work one day to the chemistry department and I passed by two women who are on the street and they were like, are you Steve Townsend? Do you have a brother named Chauncey? <laughs> and I was Whoa. like, uh, I am Steve Townsend and I have no clue why. I was like, how do we know each other? And they were like, 31 years ago, when you were eight, we adopted your family. So Detroit oh. had the big, like adopt the family thing uh, every Christmas, where, you know, if you were in need, people would adopt you, provide <clears> presents, <throat> yada, yada. Uh, and so these were people. And then the second they said that, I, I flashed back to being in Cobo Hall in Detroit and sitting at the table with my mom and my brother. And I remember these women adopting our family, you know, bringing us socks and clothes and, and all these other toys and, and different contraptions. Uh, so it was, it was pretty crazy. But to me, that was like, what I want my life to be, where people walk down the street and they remember me because I helped them. Uh, and, and not in a, 
you know, publicity style way where it's like, this person donated a million dollars. I don't need people to know, uh, right? I just want to affect people in a very positive, big way every day. And to me, I think that's how I define being a humanist. That was a long answer. <laughs> no, that, I mean, that was, that was a beautiful answer, though. Beautiful answer. Yeah, it's, ama it's amazing. You, you, you know what, Steve? You know, it comes across even from the ways you write your scientific papers. You know, I just can't forget about, you know, the way you described, um, you know, at some point, I don't, I don't even remember what, what paper that was, but, you know, you were, you were speaking about the challenges of running a multidisciplinary uh, research program, you know, working, putting together chemists and biologists. You know, you were basically speaking about human relationships with people coming from different backgrounds, you know, find, finding common ground, finding a common language. You know, I've, I've never read a, a paper written with that type of style. It was, it was, it was really quite amazing. I just can't, can't forget. You know, Frank, you probably know what, I'm, what, 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 I, what I speak about as well. You might have read that. Yeah, you, you know, you, you're, you're too kind. Uh, I would say if you look at Carolyn Bertozzi, Sam Danishevsky, Laura Kiesling, uh, there are people when they write, they really draw you in. Uh, and, you, you know, so for me, every paper that I do, I try to make sure that the introduction and the conclusion are something that any person who paid taxes and supported this research can understand what they just got. Now, that's a controversial approach in the field. I get a lot of reviews back that are like, I don't understand why he went on these tangents in the intro and why he's talking about, you know, that the AB zero blood groups are not ABO. Does that matter to anyone? Well, well yeah, it matters. Uh, and this is how we bring people into the field. Uh, so I try to be a gate opener, not a gate closer. And, you know, you can do that pretty powerfully through writing uh, if you, you don't want to do that. So like, I mean, yeah, the, I mean, this is, this is beautiful. And I think what makes you so uh, interesting and maybe dare I say unique, but like, so, you know, what you, I, I, I imagine kind of growing up in Detroit, your life could have gone lots of different ways and, and you uh, you know, there, there's probably not many people that you grew up with or went to school that are now in the position you're in, right? So are, are there specific touch points that kind of, you know, brought you to science, made you excel, like, to such a high level in science? Like, what, you know, I guess, what, where did that, like, your motivation now, right, you, you're you're very much a fully formed person, right, with, with very clear uh, motivations and values, but, like, you know, how did like is there a, is there any stories or insight into how those came about you know as you're kind of discovering science maybe an undergrad right going to grad school and working in what what is well known as a super intense lab where you where you thrive yeah it, you know and, and i will flip that question back around to you too after i answer because i think I, I know what some of your answer is going to be because it's overlap you know i i met your mom Right. And, and for me, yeah. it started with my mom. Uh, you know, my mom was, uh, you know, 17 or 18 when she had me. And I remember early on when, when I was tiny, you, you know, she didn't necessarily know what I needed to be doing, but she knew what I needed to be doing. So a good example is, you know, two hours of reading every day when I was a kid. And, you know, but what would I read? So she would bring me a TV guy, People magazine, Time magazine. Right. New York Times, it didn't matter. She would drop things on the table and she's like, you read this. <laughs> right. At, at one point, you know, I'm getting into third and fourth grade and she's like, uh, you know, I want you to start learning how to spell really well. So she started making me memorize these, you know, 18, 20, 22 letter words. Uh, so I, a lot of this was dictated by Frankie Townsend. Right. Just her knowing that I needed to be doing something to progress. Right. Educationally, scholarly, but not knowing exactly what it was. And it turns out in hindsight, it probably doesn't matter. You know, her philosophy was read as much as you can, as often as you can, right? And that'll get you where you need to go. So for me, it started out as, right, just my mom sort of micromanaging and making sure I had as much education as possible in the midst of this tough city, right, tough neighborhood. And where yeah, was that... that coming from in here? You know, why, 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 why was she? I, I, I guess that was quite unique in that context, wasn't it? Yeah, it's super unique, but I think it came from, uh, you know, the, the United States <laughs> penitentiary system. So, right, if you look at through our, through our family, tons of super smart men, tons of very bad decision makers, yeah. right? So, you know, two of her brothers did significant time, um, you know, under incarceration, right? Uh, I can go through the, the annals of towns and men who super smart, but chose to do something different. You know, my great grandfather was a bootlegger in Tennessee for 30 years. Uh, 
so yeah, so I, I think she she knew what bad looked like and knew how to avoid that, and she sort of steered us all down the right path. Yeah, I mean, I mean, in a very different right kind of life experience, but that that isn't dissimilar. I mean, my mom, my neither of my parents um, had a four year degree, uh, and they knew they wanted to be like they they saw education right as a way towards right what they considered as success. Uh, and they didn't exactly know how to teach me to do that, but they knew that's what I should do, right? So it was always, you know, whatever, man, I, they would go to parent-teacher conferences, and they would come back with a huge list, like, all right, you're doing flashcards now, you're doing you're doing these spelling things, we're buying, we're buying you, right, like, uh, right, the books of all the words, so you can go through them. And so it was always this just kind of general, like, you need to be above average, like, you need to be not only above average, like, this is your way right, to do better than we did, right? And we don't even know kind of what that path is. We don't know how to how to do that. But we know that, right, these pre these things in preparation will get you there. And I remember, like, I, and it really, I recognize, I didn't realize, like, when you're a kid, you don't realize that, right? You, oh, my mom wants me to do this. And, like, I was very much a people pleaser, still am. So I was like, yeah, yeah, absolutely. I'll do this, mom. This is great. <laughs> and it wasn't until, I, I remember distinctly, I went to college. And they moved me into my dorms. And then they were just kind of like, all right, well, uh, you've reached the end of what we know how to advise you with. So, like, go do well in college, I guess. Right? And I felt like that first semester I felt so lost because I was like, oh, like, there's no path anymore. Right? Like, for all these years, right, I thought they knew well. I thought they knew better. And then all of a sudden they're like, no, like, we don't know. We don't know how to advise you anymore. Like, you, you should... Like, we have these dreams for you, right? And I felt a large sense of obligation, um, right, to, to kind of, again, people pleaser, right? Like, uh, live up to the expectations they had for me. But then I realized, like, they, they didn't know how to get me there anymore, right? So I think that was both challenging, but, like, amazingly freeing, because I was like, oh, like, I get to choose my own path at this point, Right. I feel like I've met a lot of people, and especially in science, where I just read this crazy stat that, like, over 85% of academics have par have educated parents, right? So, like, I and I, you know, I talk to lots of my colleagues and friends, and, right, often there's, like, especially in grad school, right, there was these expectations from their parents of, oh, I, you know, I need to be doing this, I need to do that. And I'm like, huh, that's weird. Because, like, I, when I went to grad school... I entered grad school making more money than my dad was making at the same time, right? So, like, as soon as I got into grad school, I felt like I won, right? I'm like, <laughs> oh, yeah, all right, I got this. And then everything's been gravy since then. And, I mean, again, that's, like, that's so freeing, right? Because I, like, I, you know, I'm doing this now for me uh, and, right, to kind of fulfill my passions. And then and then um, as I've kind of started to, you know, become more of a, a – adult and, and realize, right, I can uh, not only uh, hopefully do good science, but also, again, be this vehicle through which other people can, you know, find success in their careers and things. You know, I, th I think it's far more fulfilling, right, because I'm doing it for myself and my core value system, and I don't kind of have this impending expectation above me. Yeah, I, I'm with you, man. Uh, and, and everything that you said just resonated. And, that, you know, I'll just touch on the very end point, because, you know, I'm at my, I guess, eighth person who graduated with a PhD. And so, uh, you know, they leave and it's funny because they never actually leave. Uh, and this week alone, I spoke to three of them. So one of them has industry interviews. He called me last night freaking out because he got his first job offer. Uh, and, you know, <laughs> Professor Danishewski would say like, congrats, you just doubled your salary, man. Uh, <laughs> or but, triple, you know, yeah. Or triple. But yeah, you, you know, there's another who's going out for an uh, academic positions this year. There's another who uh, you know, she's at Abby and she has people who she's now managing and she's calling me and she's like, what am I supposed to do here? So, so yeah, I think, you know, as uh, amongst the many things that we have to do in our jobs, those three conversations this week were far, you know, they were just so fulfilling, right? Because, you know, these were people who are brought into the group. They were tiny. They were, they were little people. They were kids. And, and now they are grownups and they're calling you about like grown up stuff. And it, it's just phenomenal to watch them succeed. You know, they're taking pictures of their babies and throwing their kids at me when they come here to visit. I'm like, you know, your son is Ariel because you just launched him at me for a picture. But I, I love it. it, it I, don't know. I think that's what makes the job really cool.
you know, I, I, there are a lot of like crazy things about this job, right? And um, we talked about, right, papers, awards, et cetera. I didn't, re like, there is nothing more fulfilling than students who you watched, right, mature through this process go on to be successful. Uh, my first year, or my first class that graduated, graduated during COVID, right? But four amazingly talented people who are doing awesome right now. And when the fourth one graduated, I just like, that evening, I just went out into my porch and like, I just like started crying because I was just like so overcome. I was just like, oh my gosh, like this is, it's just a, a feat, like the, an intense fulfillment that like, you know, I have, right, I have now with my child, but like, you know, uh, you know, it's, it's certainly below that, but it's, yeah, it, there's kind of not words to describe it. It's, it's why you do this job, right? It's why you send off into pe people into industry making way more than you do and right kind of work constantly and are and are kind of ground down too much but yeah that 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 feeling uh you don't trade it for for much uh, this is yeah. what you is 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 this type of feeling that gets you out of bed in the morning or, or are you more speaking about or thinking about your science it, what what is, what is the first thought you know when you drink your coffee is it is it you know your it, it's people know, your, it's people interest yeah I mean, science, science is great and, and I love it, but it's, uh, you know, it's secondary to, to the people. And I think that's what I'm getting, you know, we're both getting at. It's like those are like, it's the people that's the proudest moment. Yeah. And you don't like, you don't fully realize that because when you start the job and especially the interview process is such a grind and there's such an intense focus on the science, right? So you like go in, you know, you're just, you're just drilled to go in with that as the most important thing um and and then when, once you kind of like you know get kicked around a little bit and really start to develop relationships with with your students and stuff you know that's when i think at least i transitioned into realizing you know doing great science is important and it's important to teach those people to do great science right so it's almost like the motivation for great science shifts to be more about education than it is right the uh the actual like pushing on kind of the science, I guess, as, as uh, I thought about it in my, in like the interview process. Would you guys say that most great scientists are strong people, people? Because I don't think so, but I might be off. Yeah. You know, I think that the, the, the best scientists you know, I don't know if they're necessarily people, people, but they understand how to motivate people. Okay. Uh, well, so, they are know, people, I, people in some sense then. Yeah. Yeah. I think the best academics, right? There are, there are amazing scientists in other disciplines who don't have to manage a bunch of people, right? True. Uh, but when you talked about like, you know, the best scientists, I don't know. I always think you mentioned Carolyn Bertozzi before. And I always think of her because she does awesome science, but she's also just a has better kind of interpersonal skills than almost anybody I've ever met. Yeah, and, and, and she has this, this charisma. There's an aura to these people. And, and I see this in, in you too as well, which, which is amazing, right? You know, there's, there's, there's something intangible in the way you speak, in the way you, you move even, you know, even, even virtually. You know, I, I haven't met you guys in person, right? But it comes across even, even in the screen, which is, it's kind of fascinating. That's why we're having a video version of the podcast now as well, because you know it's kind of more powerful. So we can we can see that you 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 know you look good as well. You don't only do good stuff. Well, that, well, that, that's well. why you focus us. That's why you focus a podcast on you know early career people, because but if you, if you would interview us old <laughs> folks, then we wouldn't look as good on video. Well, you never you never know. We might we might, uh, we might people the podcast. We, we might look at uh, you know people at late later age. And maybe as as you guys get older, you know, we, we can we can keep track of you and do more episodes, you know, in ten years and see how you look. I'm I'm, I'm sure you look great, Steve. Steve, despite looking a bit older, still looks great, doesn't he? Dude, it, you know, it, it's tough, man. Uh, I think it was a couple. So I don't remember if this was after the first podcast or or before it, but you know, I went to the doctor uh, and you know, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, <laughs> right. And she was like, you, you know, this is a product of your job. You, you know, she was like, you know, can you have a, a better relationship with stress? Right. Because if the answer is no, then 
ear is an ACE inhibitor. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, luckily we got everything under control, but, you know, I think about like, yeah, how much does the stress or like uh, just the day-to-day -day grind of this job actually impact your physiology? Uh, and so, so that's my new thing. So, so yeah, you know, I've always been like a guy who tries to stay fit, does a ton of exercise, uh, but you know, stop eating meat recently, right? Ooh. Positive effects after that, you know, I've, I was always convinced that I couldn't build muscle mass if I wasn't just eating, you know, my body weight and grams of meat. Well, that, that, that's <laughs> not true because right. You know, I'm 165. I still bench press 235. Oh, wow. Right. You know, squat, I should work on that. Cause my legs look like little sticks, but yeah, I, I'm all in the gym. I'm with the undergrads attempting to like embarrass them on the basketball court. Anything I can do to like through osmosis, steal their youth and re right. Replenish myself. That's what I do. Can you, can you still dunk? So I can dunk with one hand. I can no longer dunk with two hands. And that was sort of a devastating thing. Uh, How tall are you? So I'm 5'10". Uh, but you so know... So the man jumps. I, I know people in Detroit when I was like... Because everybody started dunking around 6th, 7th grade. I know guys 5'5", five, 5'6", five, five, who can, you know, off the backboard. They're just aerial. You're watching them through the air. Yeah, man. Growing up in South Dakota, we, we didn't have that. <laughs> We have a bunch of Scandinavians. Like people are. It's funny. I still go back home. People are giant. Like I'm a big dude. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna tell you my weight. Like you're throwing out yours, right? <laughs> but I'm. I'm six four. Uh, so in you know, I walk around at scientific conferences and feel like real big, right? I, I go home back to South Dakota. I feel small. Like people are. People are large. Like, if you look at a football team, right? Offensive de defensive line. You know, a lot of big Midwest uh, kids there. You know, uh, basketball players, not it's not so much our game. And can so, you dunk, Frank? Uh, just call me out here. I was able to <laughs> dunk. I was able to dunk with one hand for about a month in college when I was at the peak of my physical condition. Like, I'm not, I'm not known for my vertical. Um, and no, I can't dunk. But I do, uh, you know, I just, I absolutely love team sports. Um, so I, every, like, my saving grace is every Wednesday, I go play pickup basketball. Obviously, North Carolina has um, a really good pickup games. Uh, so I don't play with the undergrads anymore, but we have kind of a an old old man game. Uh, but we bang, we play full court, and it just like kind of a bunch of stress builds up till Wednesday, and then it, it's all left out there. And it's it's amazing too, right? Because you, you walk out on the court, and there's faculty members like myself. There's guys who are coming in from the maintenance crew. We've had like vice presidents, vice provosts. And none of it matters, right? You walk on the court, everybody's the same. Nobody talks about work. You play hard for an hour and a half, and then then you go shower, and then you can re-enter kind of right the the normal academic realm with all its hierarchies. Nurturing your competitiveness that is useful every day. Yeah, gets a yeah, uh, it's a good outlet for it, right? A very healthy outlet for it. As long as my knees hold up, uh, probably probably same as Steve. I'll I'll keep keep going. Yeah, the knees, the hips, uh, yeah, things start to hurt, which is like a crazy thing. So, you know, I've been doing like really intense power yoga and, and yeah. that's been game changing. I don't know why I didn't do that 20 years ago, but, you know, waking up and having things hurt feels weird. It's just new. <laughs> yeah, the, the, the yoga is, yeah. The, I took a few classes of like yoga for athletes and I just keep doing that same stuff. It's it, it's key. Um, oh, so let, let me... I kind of had two. Uh, I'm just going to take control, Paolo. Sorry. Yeah, no, totally. Yeah, I, I told you. I'm, in, I'm kind of enjoying this. It's going better than I expected. So you know, yeah. Uh, so far, so good. Carry on. I always love to ask all academics this question, um, but like, what, like, what? When I say, like, what are times you failed or felt like inadequate or insecure? Well, like, what, what things come to mind from your career? Because, like, yourself, right? Like. The public perception now of Steve Townsend is, right, talented 12 award winner, other award winners, right, super successful. But that doesn't, I think that's a sometimes a bad example to give to students who are who are in it right right now. So, like, talk about some of those, talk about some of those times that come to mind when you say, when did, when did you fail? Like, where, where did you learn a lot from your failures? Uh, and how did that kind of progress into, into a the man you've become today or the scientist you've become today. Yeah. You, you know, I, so, right. You know, I'm not a big fan of like social media. I start with that because uh, I think social media is sort of like a highlight reel. So a lot of, there, there, there are positive aspects from what I hear. I don't participate, but it, it seems that there's a lot of like crowdsourcing of self-esteem and 
because social media is this like highlight reel, people don't get a real uh, depiction of life. So, you know, I was teaching a couple of days ago. We might talk about this because I'm teaching spectroscopy this summer or semester. <laughs> I normally teach physical organic chemistry or synthesis, so spectroscopy. But, you know, I was telling the students, you know, a couple of months ago, I ran my 7,500th reaction because I've, I've kept track because that's, that's just part of the competitive compulsion that I have. I've run over 15,000 NMRs because that, that's how it goes. Uh, but, you know, I, I had to make sure they knew that with those 7,500 reactions, you know, how many were no reaction or undesired product? How, how many did not work in the pure sense of this is not what I wanted to get, right? But there's a difference between this is not what I wanted to get and a reaction failed. Uh, every reaction that you run, you learn something from it. So, uh, you know, I've always had pretty reasonable self-esteem. Uh, you know, I can accept when I fall short and do what I need to do to make the change to, to correct it. But falling short is manifold, it's ubiquitous, right? We, we do something that we could have done better every single day. You know, my four-year-old was being a maniac this morning at drop-off and I, you know, I turned around and yelled at her at a red light, right? I wish I could get that playback, right? Uh, she, you know, I didn't need to yell at her to get my point across. So that was a shortcoming and, and, and I'll fix it for the next time. Am I gonna not yell at Angela again for taking off her seatbelt? No. <laughs> Right. But at some point I'll, I'll get the parenting correct and I'll figure out how to make sure that she understands that she needs to wear this thing when we're in the car and just because she knows to take it off, not to take it off. So, so, so yeah, I try to, to, to really tell students that, you know, we're all still a work in progress, right? Any success that this lab has attained because of the phenomenal students that work here, right? It, it takes a lot of work, a lot of trial and error, uh, a lot of restarts, right? Sometimes it's one step forward and then 15 steps back before we get the correct route to make a natural product. Uh, so, so yeah, I, I think you're, you're correct, man. I, I never want people to see and compare themselves to finished products. First year graduate students do that. Oh, I was, I was, I was mentored by this person who was a fifth year. They were so good. I don't know if I can ever be as good as them. Sure. You can, but you have to crawl yeah. before you walk. <laughs> yeah. I remember, I mean, speaking of that point that hits home, I, November of my first year of graduate school, my advisor was Craig Hawker. I walked into his office. I sat down and I said, well, it's pretty clear I need to I need to quit. And he kind of looks at me and he's like, what? I'm like, well, I, like, I don't know if you see it, but like everybody is so much smarter than me, right? They they all like know all, the, like they talk routinely about things that I have no freaking clue about, right? And they, they seem to know all these people in the field and I have no idea who any of them are. So it's like clear I don't fit in and I, I need to leave now. And he kind of looks at me, he goes, you know what, Frank? I had a postdoc in my office a week ago that said the same thing about faculty members because he because that postdoc wanted to go out for a faculty position. He's like, again, I think your comment about don't compare yourself to finished products, right? He said, like, you're supposed to feel like this, like this is normal, right? And you you are going to by the time you're a fifth year graduate student, first year graduate students are going to come into my office and say the same thing about you. He's like, what you got to do right now is just like get better every day, you know, go in and, you know, he knew the reactions I was working on. He's like, go in and become an expert at that reaction. And then next week, you're going to move on to the next reaction. You're going to be an expert at that. And the next week, you're going to become an expert at the end, uh, at the next one. And then in five years, you're going to be expert at a whole bunch of different things. Right? So that uh, I was, you know, I'm always kind of at ahead of myself and looking forward. And again, right, kind of blindly ambitious, especially back then. Um, but that's, I mean, that's such an important point, right? Like, and that was part, like the start kind of of my evolution of kind of finding my place, right? In the scientific arena where I always felt extremely uncomfortable because I never kind of knew any scientists growing up, right? I've always, you know, I, I, this idea of imposter syndrome, right? I've, I've always felt a significant portion of that. And right in my darker moments, I still feel that, um, but I've obviously matured and, and, and come to uh, balance it a lot better. So you mentioned, I, like, I, I think your answer, Steve, was an answer from the perspective of somebody in your position, right, who's been through a lot of experiences. But it, can you think back to a time like early on in grad school or in undergrad where, right, you didn't have this really balanced perspective, but you were, but you had like a really hard time and, and didn't deal with it well, but also didn't uh, kind of know how to, how to rationalize that? 
Yeah, you, you know, because it, it, it's, it's tricky when you're now, you know, 39 years old <laughs> and you, you don't want to like um, place the 39 year old perspective, like right? wisdom and the ability to be comfortable in your own skin on your like 19 year old self. Right. Uh, so, you know, I do remember those times. And I, I remember one specifically where my undergrad advisor, you know, Amanda Bryan Friedrich, she's a you know, superstar. People know her. She's the dean of uh, the graduate school at Wayne State now. Uh, you know, she asked me to go in and make uh, some Des Martin variety name for a grad student. And I was like, cool, I can do that. You know, Big Steve has it. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, the result of that experiment was a hood on fire. And oh, right. And the fire department coming in and me having to call in Amanda to tell her what happened. Oh, uh, so, you know, right. And, you know, Des Martin itself, right. I, I don't believe it's inherently explosive. This was because of potassium bromate or whatever oxidants I was using that were not safe, right? It wasn't oxone. Uh, but, you know, I do remember the aftermath of that, right? I was like, you know, am I cut to be a chemist, right? I couldn't make this simple reagent without setting a hood on fire. Uh, and so that, that's a that's a very extreme version uh, of, of, of what you're handing at. But yeah, I think we do all experience those moments where uh, you, you're trying to, you know, something happens, and you're trying to reconcile what happened with where you want to go in life, right? And uh, there's a tendency as human beings for us to create roadblocks. So, I, you know, I had a tough couple of weeks after that, but I remember people in the department, uh, you know, Roman Dembinski, a couple of other faculty, and they're like, if you're going to do this job, you got to get over what happened a couple of weeks ago, right? Because mm -hmm. most people have some form of a fire, yours escalated to torch an entire hood, hood's out of there, hood's been replaced, why aren't you in there running a column? <laughs> <laughs> so, so, yeah, so, I, right, yeah, I... I you, you got to get comfortable with discomfort. Uh, and I, I think this job and most jobs in, in general have it, you know, over this semester, I got my first, you know, three or four requests to write support letters for people, whether it's tenure or promotion to full. Uh, and, and so, right, discomfort. I've never done this before, but now I have the appropriate rank where people are asking me and there's no reason to say, no, I got to figure this out. And so I'm experiencing discomfort at the moment because these are people's careers so so yeah you got to right be comfortable with the fact that that's just part of the game and realize that what got you to this point will get you through the next hurdle it's an evidence yeah, of personal growth right so you 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 and, and that's important because you, you know for how experienced and successful you are you probably still want to to to, to grow and to to do more right absolutely yeah now you can you're mature enough where you can like almost look at yourself from an outside perspective and say, oh, I am experiencing discomfort. I am experiencing discomfort right now because this is new. All right. But yeah, I'm, I, I've built the skills to do that now also. But yeah, when I was 20, I had no idea how to do that. Right. I was kind of just like a ball of ambition and emotion trying to find my place in the world. So it was, I, I always think back to those times, you know, when trying to empathize with graduate students and right. I, I think it's good that right. The conversations around, mental health and, and the challenges they face have been more normalized. Uh, and I felt like, you know, uh, we've all experienced some portion of that. But I don't know, it was never normalized to talk about it when I was in graduate school, right? So I kind of like dealt with that uh, in silence, which usually almost always isn't the healthiest way to deal with these things. Yeah, you know, I, I've been seeing a therapist uh, just for like general mental health maintenance since I was 20 four years old. Uh, and, you know, I didn't have a problem talking with it. I'm right. To me, this is something you need to normalize and it's normal. Uh, you know, more recently, Vanderbilt's administration purchased 12 cognitive therapy sessions for every person on this campus. Uh, okay. They want people to take care of themselves. And I think it's, it's super important. You know, I agree with what you said. Uh, anything that I was experiencing, uh, you know, when I was a trainee, Gary and Sam would have been more than receptive to hear problems. I wouldn't have went to them to, to share anything. Uh, you right. know, the day before my candidacy exam, my brother uh, got in trouble and was incarcerated. Uh, and the next day I went in there and took my candidacy exam and I didn't say anything to anyone, not to Gary, wow. not to lab mates. And that's just because, you know, it wasn't a shame thing. That was just, it wasn't the culture to go and, and share and discuss. Uh, the times have changed and I think it's a lot healthier for people because this door has to close all the time now because people need to come in and talk and, you know, Here's the Kleenex and the Kleenex run out. Here's a chem wipe or something. Uh, but people need to talk and share. And we have to be there for them in a way that uh, I think our mentors were what 
you know, they, they would have been there, but I don't think it was the culture of the, the population to go to them. How was, I, I just got to ask a personal curiosity. How, how was Sam's, how was entering Sam's lab, uh, you know, as a young graduate student, I mean, Sam, uh, Sam's lab is kind of infamous, right? He's kind of a chaotic, super intense, brilliant, brilliant person. Um, and I, the stories I've heard from his group kind of mirror that. So do you have any yeah. uh, you know, any cool stories? What, what was that like? I mean, it was wild. Everything that you've ever heard is, is typically true. Uh, you know, um, you, you know, we have all these joking moments where I remember I was at the board one time and I turned around and, uh, you know, he was enjoying some mustard packets. Uh, this is a world famous <laughs> story that everyone's heard because, and, you know, and it, that's not isolated to me. Other people experienced it. And they're like, you know, I was like, Sam, what are you doing? Because I, I don't have any tax. So I just asked, like, why are you eating mustard, man? And he's like, well, you know, I like the taste of mustard. And it makes me feel like an astronaut. Because when he was a kid, the astronaut ate food out of packets. <laughs> uh, that is the but, best answer that you could anybody could ever give to that question. You know, the guy is phenomenal. I still speak to him once a week. Uh, you know, he's retired and doing well. But, you know, super intense lab. Uh, you know, when I got there, there were 24 postdocs. And like wow. three or four grad students and uh the you know it was very clear that you want to make a a good impression really quickly i had an unorthodox start uh because you know within the first three months i had a jacks paper right and so uh, and that was you know I, I don't claim any type of genius that that's just the right person at the right time and desperation uh, because I, I needed that paper man <laughs> 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 and, 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 but fun place to work most scholarly person I ever met in my life I mean you know he would call the lab every you know from his office once an hour on the hour to ask about reactions you know he has this idea generation like you couldn't believe and you start to realize you know how, how you do this job right every idea isn't going to be great he's like you know every hundred ideas maybe two of them are, are fine right but you got to crank that wheel and come up with the bad stuff I think the biggest lesson, and I'll stop talking because this is starting to get on ranting, but, <laughs> you know, I remember he, in his offer letter, it says, you know, paraphrasing, he doesn't like hero worship, right? He puts his pants oh. on just like we do, his, right, shoes, eats the same snacks, we're all equal. And so he's like, it is very clear that if I have a dumb idea or give a dumb, you have to tell me. There is no, oh, I can't say this to Dan Shevsky. So yeah, you know, we would be at the board and he would toss out an idea and I'd be like, oh yeah, man, that's, that's not, that's not it, man. We, that's not the direction. And he'd be like, oh, cool, cool. Right. Cause it's important to him that we, if we're going to look like idiots, it's in the lab. It's not in front of Merck. It's not while you're giving a seminar. Uh, and, and so I think he, he normalized the ability to, to make sure that people correct you. And I tell the grad students, like, you know, if you're expecting me to like lead us to the promised land, right, we're going to end up in the Pacific ocean. Cause we're going to go off a cliff. Cause I'm going to like call the wrong play. So you got to be able to call audibles and you have to be comfortable saying, Steve, this ain't it, man. And they all are. Yeah. Yeah. What, do they do that? I think we found the, the title to the episode has to be uh, something around, you know, mustard makes me feel like an astronaut. <laughs> <laughs> that is just amazing. That, that would be creative. <laughs> I'm surprised you hadn't heard that story before. Everybody has that one or some variation of like, and it's always like with a snack, right? No, you know, so people, yeah. I heard uh, <laughs> my, my postdoc advisor was Tim Jamison. He said he went to, you know, to, to a meeting where Sam was and they were staying in the same hotel. Uh, and at like midnight, he just starts hearing this bang, bang, bang <laughs> outside the room. So he walks out there, his room is by the vending machine, and it's Sam with one hand up the bottom of the vending machine and pounding on it because his, you know, he put in money and the snack didn't come out. And he, just, he, just, he turns to him, looks at him and goes, I paid for this. <laughs> yeah, but, but the snack thing was like super serious because, you know, now, so I, I talked to him, he he's about six foot six one and he weighs about 180 pounds he lost a lot of weight really fit oh, wow great right. he walks and jogs uh but he told me he was eating bulgar and i was like you don't eat bulgar i was like you eat meat and candy and he's like <laughs> oh no i'm uh, i'm right i'm 86 now i can't eat that crap i'm eating bulgar <laughs> and like quinoa 
And I, I, I don't believe him unless the ball guard has like chocolate mixed in with it. Because, <laughs> you know, there was one time we were coming back from lunch and we passed by uh, this ice cream truck, Mr. Softy, right? New York City. And yeah. at Mr. Softy and at the McDonald's where they sell ice cream at these other stores, they all have like cards that says like, you know, if if lost, call Sam's kids. So we walked by Mr. Softy and they're like, hey, hey, you guys are in Sam's lab. He left his briefcase. <laughs> Because they knew, like, you know, he leaves his briefcase. It's, there's a trail of evidence of where this guy was eating, right? And I'm just like, you know, where do I work? And when I tell these stories in the future, are people going to believe them? And it turns out people do believe them. But, you know, so we're, we're all of this is in jest and it's great because Sam's a character. But what I'll, I'll tell you to, to sort of accompany this story is that, you know, maybe the last 10 or 12 seminars that I've gone to give, I'm meeting with people and the conversation at some point goes, I'm here because of Danishevsky. I, I, you know, I'm at Scripps and I'm talking to Dale Boger and he's like, you know, I'm here because of Sam, Gene Kwan Yu. I'm here because of Sam. So, you know, he, he really had a knack for assisting and placing people. You know, Margaret Chu Moyer, Angie Angelis, there's so many women in chemistry who are heads of chemistry, heads of, right, different divisions that came out of this lab. Uh, and, you know, we always make note of that because that was at a time where people were trying to close the door to women. And Sam was one of the people who assisted in sort of knocking that thing down, saying like, you know, all right, we're not going to be unfair here. Let's get talented people in the right positions, regardless of how they look. Yeah. Yeah. And I, yeah. Uh, yeah. I, n- I never had the opportunity to meet Sam, but, but the, the positive stories, right. Are uh, I think, I think kind of uh, the character that he is, is so infamous because right. He is so brilliant and has had such a positive impact on so many people's lives. Right. The fact that we're all still talking about him routinely and he's been retired for, for quite a while now, I think speaks to that. Yeah. And, you know, Paolo mentioned writing earlier, you know, I tell you, if you want to read some fun stuff, go to, you know, Sam's Maui crystal paper, uh, because at one point, uh, you know, he ends it by saying, we have learned much from operation Maui crystal. <laughs> like, so, you know, he had to fight. Oh, right. Now I need to go there. <laughs> it, it, it's the crazy, it, it, that was his analogy. You know, he would try to bring real life scenarios into every single thing that we did. He's like, so, you know, when you parachute it behind enemy lines, you know, what Lewis <laughs> acids? <laughs> like Lewis acids and enemy lines. I, this is how my father-in-law speaks. You know, you have all these military <laughs> metaphors. <laughs> they explain life. Yeah. <laughs> I had one, la- I had one uh, last thing I wanted to, to pass by you. Um, so I was talking to, at the last ACS meeting, I was talking to Becca Clausen, right? Who's at John, Johns Hopkins, who's just a right. fantastic person and scientist. Uh, and we were talking about you. Um, and one of the things Becca said that resonated so much with me is, right? I, uh, I think the, this was in your Talented 12 talk, you, right? Talked about uh, your time at Columbia, being in New York City, going to Harlem, right? And seeing advertisements for uh, formula, and then going to the Upper East Side and seeing advertisements for uh, breastfeeding. And what Becca said, I want to give her all the credit, is that is the most clear and and the only I can think of, you know, comments and bringing in intersectionality into kind of hardcore chemistry discussions, right? And I think it takes a, a person like yourself who's had such a varied life experience to do that. Um, so I don't even know if I have a question. I thought that was just the, like a, a really amazing, I mean, it, uh, one, a really right amazing thing that you, with your life experience, were able to recognize, right, this, right, this aspect kind of during your time in New York City, uh, but then bring that into, right, your motivations for working on uh, a really scientifically rigorous challenge. Uh, so. I guess my question would be kind of like, you know, walking around New York City, right, and, and interacting every day, going going into Columbia where, right, it, it didn't look a lot like Harlem, which was four blocks away, right? I think I think Columbia's on 116th, Harlem's 120th, right? Yep. Yeah, so ha- like, and that, and that also bleeding into kind of your science and eventually what you pursued in your independent career, right? Like, how, how has that kind of stuff shaped you or how do you think about that as you're now in Nashville? Yeah, um, you know, so Nashville is a great place for uh, attempting to have these like um, either Oscar Wildean or Aristotelian type of uh, synergies, right? Depending on which side of the coin you play on. 
you know, I look out my window and I see the tower from Jubilee Hall at Fisk University, Tennessee State, Meharry Medical College. Those three HBCUs, three other ones in the city. Uh, so I think these opportunities uh, to really uh, stay true to self and, and, and really merge your life with your careers is really great to do here. Um, all of this for me stems from my mom telling me that she thinks scientists were con artists uh, a long time ago. Wow. <laughs> like, you know, there's no fields on earth except for science where people can use your money and have the audacity to not tell you what they're doing with it. Yeah. And I was like, yeah, you, you know, how many people do I know who probably can't grab a person walking down the street and explain what they're doing with that person's tax money and doesn't care to? Uh, and so I wasn't going to be that guy. Every person in my lab, if you ask them what we do, uh, they can formulate an answer that's responsible to the United States taxpayers, right? Uh, to the general public who we, right, I, I think we answer to. Uh, so, mm -hmm. you know, that's why I do it. Um, I, I think those are the most important problems. Uh, you know, when I started here, the senior faculty gave me a Costco sized bottle of Tums. I was like, what is this for? <laughs> right. And they're like, you'll find out when you start hitting that grant writing grind. Uh, <laughs> But, you know, at some point that then made me realize, like, we should start thinking about gut inflammation. So we have projects now that are thinking about celiac disease, Crohn's disease, right? Major inflammation, acute inflammation, just uh, the, the process of being a human is stressful and you feel you feel that physiologically. So we're trying to figure out how can we really um, uh, impact some of those ailments in human disease when it comes to using organic chemistry. Uh, so, so that's why we do it. And I think Nashville is a great place to do it because uh, this place is a... It's not just the bachelorette party capital of America, which it's probably another entire podcast. I don't know. <laughs> well, you do another episode on that, yeah. Does, does yeah. it feel like that sometimes lately? <laughs> I live on a main artery in the downtown, and you know we'll sit there on like a Friday or Saturday night, and you just count party bus, a bachelorette party, all these you know hen parties, stag parties. Oh, I'm strange. like, why are you guys coming here? Come, come here, please, because sure, that yeah. must be yes. that must be painful. Yeah, that must be painful. Yeah, it, it can be super loud, but yeah, that, that, that's the answer. But, you, you know, I see a lot of synergies whenever I read your work and a lot of the stuff that you do, uh, you know, it's just like cool stuff bleeding with application. And I can explain to people why it's super dope pretty easily. So I guess, do you have any major influences on how you pick projects or the way you like to drive the research? I mean, I, I describe this as use inspired basic research. Um, you know, I, I, th I think it is right. Like I try to go, I mean, I, I keep bringing up South Dakota, right. Cause it's a, it's a big part of who I am. Um, and it's just a different world than where I currently live. Right. And I, mean, I, I don't mean Chapel Hill or North Carolina. I just mean like being, you know, uh, in academia and being around, right. Kind of, uh, you know, really educated, high achieving people all the time, right. Going back home and it's, you know, it's a agriculture based economy you know, a bunch of people who, you know, are really smart and do work really hard. But what you said, right, that distrust of science and scientists, like, really resonates, right? But I feel like I can go back into that community and, right, I, I have a ton of friends there. I have a lot of inherent trust there, right? So I can start to, you know, hopefully bridge some of those gaps, right, and, and explain kind of the motivations, um, you know, of what we're doing with, you know, uh, with taxpayer money and, and what we're trying to advance. And so I think, I guess I haven't really thought about this part deeply. Um, but I think, yeah, the, the motivation to go home to the kitchen table with my mom and, and her friends and explain what I do, right, that's always been important to me. And it's always been important to communicate that um, to, right, the people I grew up with who were not scientists, right, but are, uh but are no less skilled in the different professions, right, that, that they go about. Um, I was also really, you know, this is kind of the, now going to an academic kind of uh, uh, nerdy explanation. I was really inspired. At some point in graduate school, I learned about Pasteur's triangle, or sorry, Pasteur's quadrant. Are you familiar with this? Yep. I am not. Yeah, Explain. so like, like on the, on the x-axis, right, this is essentially four quadrants, right, set up, set up on two axes. On the x-axis, you have practicality. Uh, and on the y-axis, something like scientific rigor or fundamental science, right? So I, I think, you know, the idea is on the, on the nobody ever wants to be, uh, uh, you know, at low academic rigor and low at practicality, right? Like, so you stay out of that quadrant. And if you're in that quadrant, you're probably not a scientist. 
right? If you're if you're on the uh, lower right hand quadrant, you're at high practicality, but right maybe like not making a lot of fundamental insights, right? That is right where a lot of let's say work in industry that's kind of on, on a timeline of six months to one year out is is doing. On the on the top left quadrant, you have where a lot of academia sits, right? Really high scientific rigor, maybe not a ton of practicality. And and honestly, you don't you don't want all academic scientists working on only practical problems, right? So it's like I, I think that's a fine place to be. But I've always been inspired and and right that's named Pasteur's quadrant because Louis Pasteur really um, uh, embodied this. Is you can do and I, and the word I use for it is use inspired basic research, right? You can do fundamental science and make real contributions, right? To, for me, our understanding of reactivity or catalysis and how it relates to making large molecules. But you can do it in a way that is at least, right, leading towards a solution to a real societal problem, right? For us, a lot of our work is in the area of sustainable polymers, All right? So that's kind of the, the Emma, like when I think about problem selection and what my lab wants to pursue, right? I always try to connect fundamental principles of chemistry that we want to advance with an application that, right, my students, and and I guess going back all the way to, right, uh, the, the people I grew up with, I can go and, and sit down at the dinner table and talk to them about it, and they understand, right, that, that what we're doing uh, kind of in the ivory tower, right, has value and, and, and can be really important and can actually, like, go back and impact their life or their kids' lives. And that takes an additional skill for the more, modern scientists, which is the storytelling aspect, if you wish, right? And obviously the fact that you work on science that has some practical application helps because it's easy to speak about, right? Because people can understand it's more tangible. But, you know, you both are great storytellers and, and, and I think you, you, you make for a very beautiful prototype of what the modern scientist should be. And I think, you know, I, I don't think we can afford as, as a sort of broader scientific community, and I put myself in it, you know, even, even though I come from industry, um, uh, you know, to be to be in this ivory tower, as as you describe it, Frank, because at the end of the day, we are uh, we are working with with, with tax money, uh, you know, uh, maybe in industry at a lesser extent, but you know, there's there's still a lot of um, you know, so, social responsibility that we all play, you know, in the broader in the broader field, and that we need to always just remember. Guys, you know, this has been the easiest episode so far. <laughs> yeah, uh, no, no preparations and, you know, you did it by yourself. It's, uh, it's, been, it's been super entertaining, uh, you know, and, and I, I have the feeling that we could carry on for another hour or so. But, uh, you know, pr probably you have better things to do. You have students to go to and, you know, science to carry on. I, it's been an immense pleasure. It, you know, it's, it's beautiful. I, I, I really appreciate you guys being willing to do this with, 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 with us. I've actually had, I actually pitched a podcast like this when I was in graduate school at CNE News. Like I've wanted to do kind of these types of conversations for over a decade. But at the, at the time when I was pitching, it was like when podcasts were new and all these places were like, no, we're not, no, we're not doing that. Like that's, that's weird. <laughs> people, like, how would they listen to it? It wouldn't be on the radio? <laughs> well, I've like, I've like, have a like. If I had time, I would, I would do this with every scientist who came uh, into UNC's. I mean, scientists are such interesting and varied people, right? Um, I, I would, I would agree. We, we try and do our best. We'll carry on. You, I, uh, you know, I've, I felt like we connected early on at the at when I met you at the Talented Twelve thing. You know, hopefully our paths cross more so we can spend more time together. But it was, uh, this was super cool conversation, uh, and you know, gave me some more insights into into yourself. Oh, dude, I, I agree. You know, uh, you know, for people who don't know, you know, usually when Frank's son gets a new pair of Jordans, uh, you know, I always get a, a picture. Right? <laughs> we're, we're jumping back and forth with that. Uh, but it's definitely been too long, man. You, you're a great person. You know, my wife wanted me to. She's like, can you get Frank's mom's number for me? Uh, <laughs> you no know, reception, you, you know. Uh, so, so, yeah, there, there's a lot of synergies here, man. We got to, like, do this more frequently. Yeah, for sure. Well, if if anything, I I'm glad that I help you guys connect and 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 spend uh, an an hour together have, having a chat and knowing getting to know each other a bit better. So, uh, and I and I hope a lot to, a lot more people will enjoy this conversation because you know it's an opportunity to know both of you better. So, uh, thanks again, and I I hope we can do this soon again. You know why not, right? And uh, maybe adding us you know a, a touch of more science into it or a touch of more fun, but. It, it was it was great fun. Thanks. Thanks again, guys.